I'd like to invite you to turn again this morning in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to continue our series, Seeing with the Eyes of Heaven. This is part two, Seeing with the Eyes of Heaven. And we're making our way through this remarkable chapter, and really a segment that began at the end of chapter 4 a couple of weeks ago, and will take us through the end of 2 Corinthians 5. I want you to imagine for a moment an infinite ball of twine. You get a hold of the end of it. You hold about an eighth inch of it between your thumb and forefinger, and you unspool the rest. Of course, it would go around this room several times. It would make its way out the door. You could throw it and then unspool it around the building several times. You could take that spool of twine out to I-10 and run it all the way eastbound I-10 to Jacksonville, Florida. And you could hurl it across the ocean and that other continent and that other ocean and bring it back around to where you started. You could take that ball of twine and circle the earth several times. You could then take it and throw it around the moon and have it come back to the earth again. And you could do that a dozen more times and then take that ball of twine and hurl it out of earth's orbit, out of the solar system, deep into outer space. And this imaginary infinite ball of twine would still keep going and going and going. And you're holding on to that eight inch end of that ball of twine between your thumb and forefinger. This ball of twine represents your life. And the eighth inch between your thumb and forefinger represents your life on this earth. You need to think about your life. You need to think about your life this morning. You need to think about all of your life. You need to talk to God about your life. You need to hear from God and his word about your life. And what you do in that eighth inch section of that ball of twine that represents your earthly existence makes all the difference for all of the rest. I'm drawn in my own heart and I want to draw our attention to this apex section of our Bibles, the sort of mountaintop experience we get in 2 Corinthians 5. It is a significant chapter of God's Word that has the power to readjust all of our thinking about everything. We began two weeks ago at the end of chapter 4, allowing heaven's perspective on things, an eternal perspective, to change the way we think about afflictions. And if I give you seven words for this series, they are these. Afflictions, home, goal, motivation, people, business, and message. That is sort of the roadmap for this series. Two weeks ago, we looked at afflictions. This morning, we'll look at home. When you hear the word home, what do you think of? I was a military kid. I moved all around Arizona in this last segment of my life. It's the longest I've lived anywhere. I don't really have roots. What comes to your mind when you think about home? The place you've always lived, that which is comfortable, where your people are. And this morning, we're going to allow 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 8 to define home for us. Let's read it together. Follow along with me. We'll read from the Apostle Paul, God's words in 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, 
We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Sir Ernest Shackleton was an Antarctic explorer, perhaps the last great hero of the age of exploration. His adventures were obscured by World War I, and his story, one of the greatest stories of human grit, has been largely unknown. In 1909, Shackleton got within 97 miles of the South Pole. He would have been the first. He was eclipsed by another explorer, and in 1914, he set out to cross the Antarctic continent to be the first to do that. So 1914 to 1917, 56 choice men and 100 sled dogs set out in a coal-powered sailing vessel named Endurance. You can read about it in the book called Endurance. You can get into the hearts of the men and into Shackleton's own hearts through Shackleton's journals. And I'm not going to spoil the incredible story for you. It's worth the read. But I will give you some of the details. There was a period where they spent 70 days without seeing the sun in the Antarctic winter. At 100 degrees below zero and hurricane force winds. One journal entry describes the experience of the sailors after their ship was smashed by the colliding ice flows and then sunk into 10,000 feet of black, freezing Antarctic Ocean. The men lived for months on a drifting piece of ice, floating over the abyss on a precarious chunk of frozen ocean that melted and refroze and melted again, split in pieces, could have overturned at every moment, and slowly spun and drifted away from the safety of land. They survived on the food stores rescued from the ship and from seals that they could shoot. They eventually had to kill their sled dogs to conserve food. The men would often wake up to a tent full of freezing seawater as the iceberg split or shrunk. I'll read from Shackleton's journal. He writes, How fragile and precarious our resting place. Yet usage of it had dulled our sense of danger. The flow had become our home. And during the early months of the drift, we had almost ceased to realize that it was but a sheet of ice floating on unfathomed seas. Now our home was being shattered under our feet, and we had a sense of loss and incompleteness hard to describe. Friends, our abode here on this earth, in this life, is no less precarious. I want to give you a Christian view of home this morning. We'll look at five realities that ought to make Christians homesick for our permanent residence. And to let the cat out of the bag, heaven is home. The first reality that Paul gives us is found in verse 1. It is simply this understanding. We know that this life is not our home. Paul begins chapter 5 with this 4. It's an explanation of the perspective we looked at two weeks ago from uh, chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Why are momentary light afflictions to be uh, treated as light and momentary, even though they are real burdens? Because they are weighed in the balance of eternity. And this life is not our home. Chapter 5 begins this explanation. And notice that Paul says, we know this. Christians know this. Christians know this life is not our home. If you have chosen to follow Christ simply for temporary benefits in this life, my friend, that is a foolish follow. To follow Christ means you have exchanged the things of this temporary life to get everything in him. And Paul says we, and he certainly is representing his own perspective. But by including us, he is telling us how we ought to think as Christians. And to some degree, every Christian knows that this life is not our home. But we need to grow in this perspective. We forget. We become distracted. Paul includes his readers in this we to remind us how ought we to think. And he says, if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, uh, this if does not mean there's any doubt about the situation. He's not describing just a mere possibility. Whether you are alive here for the rapture resurrection event or you depart this earthly life through physical death, the earthly tent of this temporary existence will be rolled up 
it will come to an end. And he calls it a tent. And we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. Literally, he says, our earthly house of the tent. And Paul, as you know, was a tent maker by trade. He uses what was for him a familiar illustration. Tents are temporary. They are light and they are vulnerable. And he says that this tent, our earthly existence, is torn down. The idea is to dismantle the tent, but it has something of a violent connotation. It is to be destroyed. That is, the temporary shelter is coming down. Here the picture is not of a tent being neatly rolled up and placed in a backpack for future use, but demolished, shredded by the wind and the weather, no longer useful. And Paul says, if this earthly tent is torn down, we have a building. We possess a building that is a present possession we already have the title deed to. And what is it that we have? A building from God, Paul says. A building from God. He describes this in verse 1 as a house. That's a contrast to a flimsy tent. And this is a house made not by human hands. It's not handmade and it's not constructed by humans. It's not subject to the ravages of this mortal existence. Paul also describes it as eternal and in the heavens. In that it is eternal, it simply means it's not something that can wear out. It can never be destroyed. It is permanent forever. And when Paul calls it heavenly, this is a contrast to the earthly tent. Heavenly indicating that its origin is in heaven, its character is in heaven. But, but more than that, here in this verse, the idea is that the building itself is heaven. Paul is not describing the resurrection body here in this passage. He's not talking about you, you leave this body here and you go get a new body there. That's not what this passage is about at all. This is not about the resurrection. This passage gives us unique insight into what happens after you die and even before the resurrection. Heaven is the building that we possess in this illustration. The earthly temporal life here is the tent that we leave behind. And Paul, the tent maker, makes it clear by this illustration that we are not to be comfortable here as if this existence is our life. This existence is not our life. Remember, we looked at a couple of weeks ago, our life is hid with Christ in God. And when he is revealed, our real life will be as well. And so we know this is not our home. And Christians ought to be homesick for our permanent residence. There's a second reality. It begins in verse 2. We want to go home. As Christians, we want to go home. This is what Paul is indicating in verses 2 to 4. He says, For indeed in this house, and, and house is in italics there, he's referring to the tent again. You could see him pointing, Indeed in this, in this tent, in this temporal dwelling, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened. On account of this, we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. You hear in these three verses Paul's desire. And this desire is designed by the Apostle Paul in this passage to be contagious. He wants us to get his heart on this. He wants us to see this life through heaven's eyes. There's an internal longing in the Christian to go home, a listlessness about this life, a detachment from this life, a, a restless homesickness. This is Paul's heart, and it ought to be ours. I love backpacking. You know, backpacking where you take everything you're going to need for several days in, in a backpack. I love sleeping in a tent. You, you hike into a spot that you can't get to by car. You, you set up all of your items, you, you set up your little encampment after you've worn yourself out hiking to a spot. You use your camp stove and prepare a hot meal. You get into a warm sleeping bag. You use your jacket as your pillow, pine needles as your mattress, all so that you can wake up in some spectacular place that most people won't go. That's a lot of fun. 
been on backpacking trips with my dad. Memorably, Hatcher Pass outside of Eagle River, Alaska was a three-day backpacking trip that went from sea level to above alpine, cross a glacier, cross a freezing river, around bears. It was fantastic. Backpacked in Valley of the Ten Peaks in Banff National Park. I've backpacked alone on the top of Roan Mountain in North Carolina. Got stuck alone in a blizzard overnight. And yes, camping is not always as pleasant as you think it's going to be. I spent a really cold night in the Sierras with Janet. My poor wife was five months pregnant with our first. With John and April and Ashley Anderson. We were 10,000 feet up on an exposed side of a mountain. It was snowing, dark, cold, and windy. My family is camped at Doheny State Beach in California when the tent was blown upside down and filled with water. We tried to camp at Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and the tent again was filled with water and a massive downpour, and we stayed in a hotel instead. (laughs) Two summers ago in the White Mountains, we had a three-day camping trip planned, and the first night, the rain all came down the hill and collected inside our tent. I think Emmett was floating on his air mattress. (laughs) And we abruptly canceled the rest of the trip and drove home. And so maybe we tent camp in order to remember how nice our home is. Maybe that's really the purpose. (laughs) And so as I've grown older, I've learned to cope with car camping. I can even tolerate a nice hotel. Okay, I've gotten soft. The truth is, after a few days in a tent, cold, grimy, aching, tired, you start to think about a warm, soft bed and a real pillow. The conveniences of home and a hot shower, the novelty of experiencing scenic beauty and, you know, burning your breakfast over an open fire, the novelty of that starts to wear off as you're distracted about how nice and comfortable your residence at home is. And Paul says in this passage, in this tent, we groan longing. Have you ever been on a camping trip that just maybe went one day too long? And you groan. This groaning here in this verse is a continual, ongoing groaning and longing. Longing for what? Look down at verse 3. Longing to be clothed with or to put on for ourselves our heavenly dwelling. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. And here in verse 3, getting to heaven is depicted as putting heaven on like a set of clothes. This is a mixed metaphor. Heavenly existence is a permanent dwelling that we put on like clothing. And this is such an important metaphor for us to grasp because death feels like loss, doesn't it? It feels like being stripped of everything dear to us, losing stuff, losing people, losing what is comfortable and familiar, whether you're on this side of death and seeing somebody else go or whether you're contemplating your own mortality and thinking about what you lose, leaving behind what's familiar and comfortable. Death seems to be a removal of everything, leaving you exposed and naked and utterly impoverished. But not for the Christian. Not for the Christian at all. Death is the exchange of a flimsy tent, one that was wind-ripped and couldn't keep out the cold and wet anyway, and exchanging that flimsy tent for a very real, solid, eternal, God-built home. Death is not loss for the Christian. Death is gain at incalculable proportions. Notice what Paul says in verse 4. For being in this tent, we groan deeply, being burdened. Life here is a burden. There are burdens in this life. We talked about that two weeks ago. We went through Paul's own lists of the burdens he faced. Those are very real and weighty. And again, in the scales of eternity, they're seen as light and momentary. But I think the burden Paul has in mind here is not the burdens of this life, but the yearning, groaning, longing burden in the Christian heart to go home. And notice what he says in verse 4. In the the NASB, we have the word because. You see that in verse 4? It should be read on account of this. 
In other words, on account of this burden that we feel, this longing to go home, on account of this continual deep groaning, we wish to be clothed with heaven. And notice how Paul says this. We wish not to be unclothed, but to be clothed. And I think it's fascinating what he does here. Paul's longing is not merely a longing to get out of here. Uh, not merely a longing just to be done with this life. Uh, Paul is not escapist here. In fact, we see this tension in Philippians 1. Paul says, uh, going and being with Christ is better by far. And yet, from jail, Paul says, and it's probably better that I stay here and suffer and be a benefit to you. And you feel that tension. It, it is the burden of longing to be home that Paul is describing here, not merely an escaping of the hardships here. He is not complaining about how hard life is, but positively longing for heaven. And you might be thinking about the burdens of this life, and wouldn't it be nice just to go home now? Haste the day, we just say. You know, I just can't take one more presidential election cycle. I'm so tired of things breaking down, my physical body, my car, my relationships, or, you know, I'm just over people. No doubt we feel the discomforts of this life. But Paul emphasizes the direction our longing should take. He specifically says, my longing is not simply to be unclothed, that is to be stripped of this tent, the uncomfortabilities here. My deep longing is to be clothed, that is to be at home in the presence of God. This heavenly dwelling to be put on me. And that heavenly dwelling is the, the very special, radiant dwelling place of God where he manifests his presence in radiating glory for his people to behold him. That's what Paul longs for. John Calvin in his Institutes of the Christian Religion has an essay titled Meditations on the Future Life. And he talks about how to entertain the various things that come to us in life, the vicissitudes of gifts and trials. He says, when you're having a gift from the Lord, when you're experiencing some delight that God provides, remember, he is a giver of good things. So a sweet friendship, a wonderful meal, some recreational activity. Calvin helps us to remember that these things are appetizers, for what is to come when we get home. All of those good gifts from the Lord that we enjoy, and, and 1 Timothy 6 tells us God gives them to us so that we may enjoy them. Our enjoyment doesn't stop at the thing, but like an appetizer that whets our appetite for the meal that is to come, those things remind us that our God is gracious and good and knows how to give good things to his children whom he loves. And he is storing up those things at his right hand forevermore for those that are his. So you're having a good day? Think about the good days to come. It's a preminder of them. And Calvin goes on to say when you're experiencing a hard time, trials, difficulties, how should we view them? Let them detach us from this life in the ways that God designs. This life is not my home. This world is not as it's supposed to be. God has designed better things and will be there very soon. I like Calvin's advice. You know, a really good test of whether we're heeding that advice is to test our longing for heaven, particularly when things are going well, when we're full of the vitality of life, when all your vehicles are working and your roof's not leaking and you're healthy. Do you long for heaven then? Do you long for heaven when you're in a sweet spot of life, enjoying the good things that God provides? During COVID, some of us in this room lost their taste. And some have not recovered. That's just one little insight into God's kindness to us. We could be forced to refuel with no enjoyment. Pull up at the Conoco, put in the pipe, get some gas, and move on with life. But God gave us taste buds. And we took those for granted until COVID took it away. 
and God gave that back to many? Wow, coffee, trifle, or whatever it is, a steak. Do we praise God when things are good? And do those good times remind us to look heavenward? Look, it's easier to long for heaven when I feel the burdens of life in this world. We don't want to wish merely to be stripped of this tent. We wish rather to be clothed with heaven. And notice verse 4, in order that, and listen to this, listen to these words, what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Of all the expressions in the New Testament, and I've counted uh, somewhere above 40, that describe a believer's homegoing. And, and have you noticed that? Have you noticed the vocabulary of death applied to believers in the New Testament? It's called a whole bunch of different things. Our tent being torn down, uh, exchanging one thing for another, uh, sown in ignominy and raised in glory. There's, there's all kinds of metaphors for what it means to go and be with the Lord. Seldom are words like death and dying used to believers, except in the context of martyrdom. So of all of those expressions of what it means for a believer to leave this present life and go to the next, this one is my favorite. Death swallowed up by life, or what is mortal swallowed up by life. Sir Ernest Shackleton's ship, the Endurance, was swallowed up by Antarctic ice. Some of their sled dogs were swallowed up by sea lions. Their gear was swallowed up by the cold black ocean. And the men adrift on an iceberg feared being swallowed up by orcas. But here in 2 Corinthians 5.4, Paul says that the Christian actually desires to exchange this life for the next so that death may be swallowed up by life. For death to be gulped down by something bigger than it, more fierce than it to be swallowed up by life. This is what I once said at my memorial service. What happened to him? How did he die again? Oh, he got swallowed up by life. There's a third reality to make us homesick for our permanent residence. It starts in verse 5. The reality is this. God has prepared and guaranteed our home. Read with me in verse 5. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. The one preparing all of this is God himself. God is preparing our home. God is preparing our home for us. Jesus himself said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Heaven is not a self-determined existence. The realities and the enjoyments of heaven do not depend on your finite imagination to conceive of them, nor of your ability to conjure them up and create the perfect environment. The infinite mind of the creator of all things has set about to prepare a place for you, Christian. And he has prepared us for that place. You can't get in without forgiveness of sin. You can't get in without being transformed, as we saw in 2 Corinthians 3.18, from one glory to another by God, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, and then finally through glorification, being conformed to the image of Christ so that we are qualified to be there. God is preparing the place, and he's preparing us for the place, and he guarantees it. Notice the guarantee in verse 5. He gave us the Spirit as a pledge the guarantee here is this word that simply means that which is pledged ahead of time to ensure the reception of what is promised. The same word is used in modern Greek, and it is the word for an engagement ring. And what is that guarantee? What is that pledge? That pledge here in this verse is the person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who personally indwells every Christian. And it reminds us this promise of a home in heaven with God is for believers only. It is only for Christians, only for those in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And that Holy Spirit is producing for us a greater conformity to Christ. That 
2 Corinthians 3.18, transformation from one glory to another is the tangible expression of this pledge, of this guarantee, of God's preparing us and preparing our eternal home. You see, the Spirit of God in the life of a believer produces spiritual life. He makes a new creation. He produces spiritual longings. He eradicates the slavery to sin and brings about a new slavery to Christ. This Christian spiritual transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit is actually a tangible guarantee of God's preparation of your eternal home. It's like holding in your hands the title deed to an incredible property you've never visited. The Holy Spirit's presence in your life, the Holy Spirit's work in your life, Christian, is the evidence of that guarantee. There's a fourth reality. Recalibrating our thoughts, wetting our appetites for eternity, causing us to be homesick for our permanent residence. It's found in verses 6 and 7. It is this reality. Home is where God is. Home is where God is. Paul says, Therefore, being always of good courage, verse 6. We looked a couple of weeks ago at Paul's own discouragements and why there is a need of good courage throughout life. And here we find the fuel for that encouragement. And notice what Paul says about that. Being always of good courage, knowing. Knowing. Listen, there's the phony kind of bravado that is a confidence without knowledge. That will only get you into trouble. But a courage that comes from truth actually fuels genuine lasting encouragement that can withstand trials, withstand difficulties. And what is it we are to know here in this verse? That while we, while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. The words for at home and absent, they're, they're actually the same word with just different prefixes on the front. They, they carry the idea of belonging, of being with your people. So to be present is to belong where you're supposed to be, around the people you're supposed to be with. And absent means being away from where you belong, being away from your people. Know this, a Christian at home here is absent from the Lord. So there's a little bit of a double reality there. In God's providence, you're supposed to be here right now. There's a sense in which we're home, even though this isn't our home. You, you belong here, but for as long as you belong here in God's ordering of your life, you are not at home. You are absent from where you truly belong. Absent from your people. Absent from the saints gathered above. Absent from God himself. Home is where he is. That's the implication here. What makes heaven home? God. And as an aside, this is a, a reminder. We, we need to see with the eyes of heaven on this. Look at verse 7. You see the dashes in your English Bibles. This is sort of set off from the rest. Paul says, For we walk by faith and not by appearances. We walk by faith. And, and the word for sight there, the, the word doesn't indicate the power of vision. You know, your ocular abilities. Uh, it is the word that deals with that which is outwardly visible. Uh, the very thing Paul has been contrasting in this section of 2 Corinthians. The contrast between what people look at on the outside, what can be seen, versus what cannot be seen. Remember we said a couple of weeks ago, uh, in verse 18, the things which are seen are temporary, the things unseen are eternal. That's what Paul is referring to again right here. We walk by faith, not by appearances. We don't look at the outward man. We don't look at the outward side of afflictions. We don't look at the outward impressions of an apostle. We don't look at the outward impressions of Christ. We don't look at the outward impressions of, of, of each other anymore. So all of our walk in this temporal existence is a walk of faith. What is faith? It is taking God at his word. Listen, faith is only as good as its object. Its object. 
You can have a phony bravado and a false faith. You can have a confidence that is no good because you've banked on things that are not true. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. If your faith is not locked in on God and what God has declared for us, your faith is shoddy, untrustworthy. This is why we don't ever want to separate faith from biblical knowledge. Trusting the Lord and knowing what he says go hand in hand. An impoverished knowledge of God's word can only produce an anemic faith. Knowledge, knowledge of biblical truths like this one in this passage, fuel faith and courage. Why are afflictions considered light and momentary? When we know something about what eternity brings. And eternity for the Christian means going home precisely because God is there. To be enveloped in the grand and glorious purposes of his desire to bring honor to himself by loving people like us. Truly staggering. There's a fifth reality that makes us homesick for our permanent residence. It's found in verse 8. We want to go home more than we want to stay. We want to go home more than we want to stay. Paul says, We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Again, this courage comes back. Paul repeats the idea, we need encouragement, uh, encouragement, encouragement in the face of discouragements. We need to have courage that comes from biblical truth. We need to have courage that God freely provides. And this courage comes in this hope. Paul says, we would prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. We learn something about a theological discipline we call personal eschatology. You know the word eschatology, that is, what happens in the end times, but personal eschatology is what happens to me after I die. And we learn something really critical here in this verse, that there is a season, if you go to meet the Lord prior to the resurrection rapture event, you will be absent from the body. You will be present with the Lord. And Paul says that is better by far. We think of a significant loss of of losing physicality. There is a time when death separates the inner man from the outer man, that which is physical and seeable from the real you on the inside, which transcends mortality. And the human constitution was designed to be a unified, integrated, not disintegrated, being. Immaterial and material together forever. But there is this intermediate state, if you die before the resurrection and rapture event, where you will be bodiless. And we see the evidence of this throughout scriptures. The souls of those who await the vengeance of the Lord are under the throne. Uh, We see the idea that uh, people prior to the resurrection experience a bodiless presence before the Lord. And this will not be a bad thing. It's not permanent. It's not the best thing. But in the sequence of events, it is better than what we have now. Notice what Paul says. We would prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home. You won't be missing out if you go to be with the Lord prior to the resurrection. By the way, the Apostle Paul does not yet have his resurrection body. And I don't think for one moment he would rather be here. And this is true of all of those who have gone to be with Christ already. As much as we might want them to be back here with us, they don't want to be back here. They are plenty occupied with the things that thrill their souls. They are finally home. This helps us with a biblical view of what happens after death. I want you to know also in this passage, Paul's preference echoes what he says in Philippians 1.23, that that would be better by far 
And yet in Philippians 1, Paul recognized the necessity of ministering here on the earth. And so Paul said he was torn. Better by far to leave you Philippians and go to be with Christ. That would have meant for Paul, all the burdens over. The fight with sin is done. Getting out of jail. The, the, the hardships that he faced that we went over a couple of weeks ago. All ceased. That would have been great. He would have preferred it better by far. And he recognized God's sovereign hand in the need for Paul's particular ministry to lay a foundation for the church, a foundation which we are building on even today, which we get to benefit from even in reading his letters. Listen, Paul was not clawing and fighting against death, not doing everything he could to avoid dying, to extend as far as possible, as far as human means would allow, a stay on this earth. No, Paul said, look, if it's today, I want to go. Leaving this life means going home. It means being done camping. It means being with him. Does your heart resonate with this preference? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I prefer that better by far. Does that tug at something in your heart? Yes, I, I want to think that way. My favorite author, she's my wife. Uh, she wrote her master's thesis on Philippians 1 and this very concept of longing for heaven. It was titled, Better by Far, question mark, Longing for Heaven in a World of Distractions. And at the time, we were working with college students who looked forward to getting married, getting a career, getting into a master's program, having kids, retiring, buying a Winnebago, having grandkids. And you just push this, yeah, I would love it for Jesus to come back, but after I fill in the blank to whatever it is you're looking for around the corner. Yeah, are, can we really say, no, it would be better by far if I were to go home today. Whatever I might look forward to right around the corner that might be great in God's plan for somebody. Does my heart say what the New Testament calls me to say? prefer rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. That is the heartbeat of the Christian, and it, it may be in you in seed form, and it can be cultivated, and it can be grown. Sometimes God grows that in our lives by snipping away at attachments to this world. All the better if we can grow through every joy and every trial to long for heaven more. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this recalibration of rethinking our earthly existence with the eyes of heaven. We pray that this would ever be our song. We pray that we would not be distracted by temporal concerns, by temporary interests, in a way that cause our hearts to stray from this preference. Lord, grow this in us. We ask that our homes and our neighborhoods, the, the people we interact with at work, would see in us this homelessness, this listlessness, this restlessness in our hearts, a homesickness for our permanent residence. Lord, may we pass this on to our children, May they not be confused by our priorities or our activities. May our priorities resonate with these truths. And God, may you make your gospel known through us. That in a way that resonates with this longing to be with you. How powerful would our gospel witness be if people knew of us we just wanted to be in your presence. And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name.